Welcome to the Imaging and Physiology session of TCTAP 2020. My name is Do Yoon Gang from Asan Medical Center. Intravascular imaging and physiology are compass of the cath lab that guides us to the best patient outcome. Physiology helps us to answer the fundamental question to treat or not to treat. And intravascular imaging guides us to the optimize our PCI by visualizing the invisible things. Anatomy and function integrated in operator mind would be the most powerful weapon in the era of the complex PCI. Today, the profits of the imaging and physiology from three continents will share their best practice routines with the cutting edge data. I would like to introduce the moderators of this session, Dr. Myung-gi Hong from Severance Hospital and Dr. Lee kyung Jang from Mass General Hospital. This is uh, Dr. Hong uh, from Seoul, Korea. is a moderator of the, the uh, imaging and physiology session of the virtual TCTAP. My co-moderator is uh, the uh, Professor Chang, is at uh, the Boston, uh, Harvard, and uh, there is a discussion. As you know, the Dr. Means, uh, Dr. Johnson, Dr. Uh, Onuma, and the Dr. Fionon, and uh, Dr. Ali, and the Dr. Kuo. We have uh, the uh, five uh, presentation from the, the well-known the presenter. And uh, Professor Chang, uh, please uh, to introduce uh, the, uh, and uh, please. Thank you, Dr. Hong. The first speaker is from New York, Ziad Ali. Uh, his title is Imaging for uh, Guiding PCI, the routine practice in my cath lab. Ziad? Um, the title of my presentation is Imaging for Guiding PCI, the routine practice in my cath lab. Uh, these are my disclosures. So I'd like to start off by just showing a very important graph that we recently constructed from our cath lab in preparation for this uh, session. Well, what you can see is that since 2011, our cath lab has had a slow and steady increase in the use of imaging and physiology. And there's a few, I think, key inflection points um, where we think that things may have had a significant impact in our program. The first you can see in 2012, a year or so after I arrived, we developed a dedicated program for fellows training. The second was that in 2016, we appointed a director of imaging and physiology so that someone could actually take ownership of this type of work. There's often a director of structural, a director of the cardiac cath lab, a director of complex and high risk angioplasty. And seeing as imaging and physiology is such an important part of our program, we appointed a director who could therefore champion this type of work. I think these are key points and going back to look at your own cath labs, volume change over time can help make a reflection on your current practice. The, one of the other interesting things that we noticed along this trend was actually that operators that were on the older side started to use things in the mid 2000s really because in every morbidity and mortality meeting, we would again use imaging and physiology to guide PCI, something uh, SJ likes to call functional PCI. This is a very important study that was conducted by our group. This is a study which looked at the perceived competency of interventional cardiology fellows trainings. So what we said to them was, we gave them a survey when they came into a training course and said, how many of you can do a physiology guided PCI? How many of you can do an IVIS guided PCI? And how many of you can you do an OCT guided PCI? And if we look at this slide, what you'll notice is that most participants thought they had expert or sufficient training when they came in, but actually only 57% showed that they had independence in all of their competencies. And if you look for physiology, the IVIS and OCT data are really quite staggering. You notice that about 80% of training physicians feel they can perform an IVIS guided PCI, but in actual fact, the independence in all of these competencies, which include things such as identifying a dissection or identifying the proximal and distal reference segments, they're really quite poor. Only about one in six operators that was in their training fellowship could actually perform an IVIS guided PCI and OCT guided PCI 
their perceived competency was low, but actually their uh, actual competency was similar to IVIS. So these are pretty staggering results. And these are the type of things that make us need to go back and think about how we are going to implement routine training and routine use of imaging and physiology in our cath labs. One of the things that we developed in our cath lab was an imaging program. So it's not all about the physicians. This is Caddy Fall. She's the director of our imaging program from a technical standpoint. Uh, she runs dedicated fellows. She centralizes the database, records all of the data, has access to the reports and actually enters information onto the reports directly so that this is a comprehensive multidisciplinary team rather than something that's read all independently by a single physician. Now this requires investment of course, and we understand that, but at the same time, we think it's very valuable. Some of the new things to look up are things like this Light Lab initiative, which is run by Abbott. One of the things that comes up often for routine use in the cath lab is that it wastes a lot of time and that it may be wasting resources. And this partnership actually allowed us to go through and look at the workflow efficiency at each step after performing OCT, for example, and it helped us to determine where exactly are the delays that are happening in the cath lab. Here's some uh, data from St. Francis Hospital where I, uh, I also work. This is a very busy center, almost 10,000 cases, 500 towers, 320 beds. And what you can see is that when you look at things in this very granular way to look at differences in timing of procedure, diagnosis, treatment, and post-procedure care, you notice that the actual treatment time in blue is relatively short. And as a result, the vast majority of time that's being spent in the cath lab, which we argue is an efficiency problem, is actually done outside of the cath lab. And therefore, we need to pay careful attention to this. And again, if we look at this in a more granular way, what we can see the treatment time takes up only a small fraction of the total time of the procedure. In fact, the physician active time is about 15 minutes and more so the procedure prep and the post-procedure time is what may be slowing down efficiency. We recognize in our cath lab that there's an ongoing risk of events even after an index PCI, and this is one of the reasons that we focus on using imaging and physiology in our cath lab. We understand that there is plenty of registry data here from ADAPT-DS showing significant benefits from imaging guided PCI, we understand that there are now two randomized controlled trials here, the ultimate trial showing a 50% relative risk reduction in angio versus IVIS guided PCI, and almost identical 50% relative risk reduction in IVIS XPL. So plenty of data starting to show up. In fact, the IVIS XPL data shows us that the benefit continues to accrue even after one year. And so the, for the, from the point of view of our cath lab, we're now able to tell administrators and other staff who are otherwise unwilling to do this that they're going to get a long-term benefit for their patients. And this really spans a large breadth of patients. You can see this meta-analysis of 30,000 patients, which actually shows a significant reduction in all of the important endpoints. It's even more uh, compelling in complex and high-risk patients. This meta-analysis shows a significant reduction in overall events and major adverse cardiovascular events in patients with more complex lesions. So it doesn't just work in simple lesions, it also works in complex lesions. This work from uh, some of uh, our colleagues who are on the uh, call or on the uh, panel show that basically an imaging guided approach works in almost every lesion type. And not only does it work in almost every complex lesion type, it also confers for the first time a mortality benefit. So I think there's no question in our cath lab that there's a benefit in terms of patient outcomes. But there's also a potential cost benefit because most cost effectiveness studies stop at one year, maybe for the longest point, two years. However, now for the first time with the IVIS XPL five-year data, we're able to significantly show that there's a long-term benefit uh, over time. One of the other benefits here of uh, imaging guided PCI, something that we recognize in our cath lab, is that the actual uh, MACE rate of imaging itself is very, very low, and that most patients can perform uh, imaging guided PCI with really no events. 
We also know that there's a significant improvement in the guidelines and we're frequently um, looking for these to be updated, especially in the sense of the new uh, recent randomized trials. We recognize that the time limit between these two um, imaging modalities versus angiographic guided PCI takes about an extra 15 minutes without any increase in radiation. So there's not really a significant time increase per se. This was almost identical in the ultimate study showing again that from a time commitment point of view, we're uh, using up about 15 minutes. We recognize that imaging can be complicated, but that really this is for the engineer and not for uh, the uh, interventionalist. For the interventionalist, we use simple algorithms. This is the MLD Max algorithm, which is sort of taking off in the OCT world, but is applicable to all um, imaging guided PCI. We perform pre-PCI looking for mor morphology, length and diameter, and post-PCI for medial dissection, apposition, and expansion. And I think use of these algorithms or sort of short eponyms to describe what we need to do, I know uh, we're gonna talk about IPSP soon, all is very helpful. Whether you should use IBIS or OCT, um, there is plenty of data published about this, but I think one of the good ways to look at it is to understand that either imaging modality can do most of the things and that there are specific areas where one imaging modality may have a benefit over the other. When do we use these? Well, we definitely think that there's a benefit in patients with complex or high-risk patients. However, what we sometimes don't know is exactly what are these complex or high-risk patients? Who are they? And we've made this a little bit more granular recently to show that patients with diabetes, end-stage renal disease, non-ST elevation MI, EF less than 30, high-end diastolic pressure, and these sort of complex anatomical lesion subsets really should be considered for imaging guided PCI because they have perhaps the likely best outcome. And where I earlier showed you that the best outcomes happen in complex lesions, as a result, because of their higher observed event rate, they actually have a much lower number needed to treat. And this may be somewhere that in your local cath lab, you may want to consider imaging. And certainly in our cath lab, we use uh, imaging for all complex PCI. So what are the actual reasons for imaging adoption? Well, we can probably get away with it. We can't, you can't do that in our cath lab anymore. I'm not really sure what to do with the information. I'm not really sure how to use a device and nobody's checking my work except me. This is the reality in most cath labs around the world, but we've made it in our cath lab that you can't get away with these excuses because people are checking and you probably can't get away with it. So we need to accept that interventionalists, although we like to talk about patients' uh, risk, we actually weigh our own risk against theirs a little bit higher, which means that when we have a simple lesion, we think we can get away with things, we tend not to use imaging, but we've now recognized that there's really no such thing as a simple lesion because we can make anything complicated. So uh, clearly angiography has its limitations. The, the benefits of intravascular imaging for PCI are irrefutable. It's clearly better to use it than not use it. And I would say that there's no more excuses. Thank you very much. Yeah, if I can ask just one question. You showed nice graph, you know, increase in volume, combined physiology and imaging. If you dissect those two, what does it show? Yeah, good question. We're doing that now. So <laughs> it's interesting, IK. So the, the, the full disclaimer of this work is that when I was looking at the title of this talk, I thought to myself, you know, I, how do I answer this question? So um, it turns out that Caddy Fall, who's our imaging director program, records every single case in a granular fashion in the database. And so what I decided to do was to go back and just to look and combine all of those sort of nine years of data. Um, our next step to become more granular is how much of that is physiology, how much of that is imaging, and then actually what uh, impacted new operators, so operators that have been done in, doing angiopies back for 30 years, um, they're now also doing imaging uh, and, and have become dependent upon it. But honestly, IK, I, I would say that the main thing is that culture that I mentioned to you of I can get away with it, I probably don't need it, nobody's checking my work anyway. Well, you know, when Gary shows up to CAP conference and they're showing an angiogram PCI with a complication in it, the first thing he's going to say, well, you know, how did you do a left main and you didn't do imaging? 
And so that culture becomes ensconced in all of us. And so we, we realize the value of this. And, you know, in some ways, if we get forced to use it at the beginning, that's okay. Because in the end, we end up learning the value from it. You know, plus they have support, Siad. You know, there's tremendous support to the interventionalists. Okay. Um, for the sake of time, Dr. Hong, probably we should move on, right? Okay. The next presentation is uh, the uh, imaging guide, the PSP for the, the optimizing PCI. Will be present, uh, Dr. Han. Yes, this is Dr. Han. It's my honor to present my topic, imaging guided PSP, optimizing PCI for complex lesions. Yes, everybody knew that uh, our current uh, safe PCI came from the, this one nice papers. Uh, Antonio Colombo nicely demonstrates that the uh, 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 impact of IVUS guidance to reduce stent thrombosis. Based on the IVUS finding, he applied the high pressure balloon dilatation. So he reduced the stent thrombosis rate from the 3 to 4% to 1.6% in six months. So IVUS is very important since 25 years ago. And yes, SJ also. They made a nice paper to, to prove that, uh, to show that the IVUS guided PCI would be safe, safer than the uh, angel guided PCI. In addition, he made uh, some criteria to optimize the minimum stent area of left main stenting, uh, five, six, seven, A. More recently, two randomized trials already published that the uh, nice demonstration that IVUS guidance is better than angel guidance. So why IVUS guidance is important? The adapted DES IVUS sub-study nicely demonstrate that the procedure would be changed after IVUS guidance in 74%. So it means that the 26% of angel guidance is limited. Uh, angel guidance is uh, limited in in the in the uh, optimizing the PCI. What is the benefit of IV guidance? You can use the larger balloon and the larger stand, high pressure balloon dilatation. You can implant it a longer stand to cover the to cover the regions. So, so the, you can detect the suboptimal stand lizard and prompt to correct it. So IV guidance is associated with the long-term favorable outcomes. Nowadays, complex PCI is increasing, including bifurcation stenting, left main stenting, CTO, the PCI in the older age. So how to optimize PCI in this case? Uh, I can take the, some hint from the BRS experience. BRS is, uh, not, uh, did not have a favorable profile, thick strut, and high rate of inflammation, so high rate of stent scaffold thrombosis. But even though uh, we applied uh, uh, pre-dilatation, stent sizing, and post-dilatation, the patient achieving the three PSP component, uh, long-term outcome is uh, fa more favorable than without these three component. So everybody used that uh, PSP, but uh, everybody didn't do that. But more, import uh, more important thing we have to know is uh, only 5% of patients achieved the optimal PSP, uh, even in the BRS uh, clinical trials. So I like to evaluate the three-year outcomes of uh, intracoronary imaging guided PSP in patients with complex coronary arterial lesions on the way to PCI with a DES. Imaging guided PSP is another new concept. Everybody knew that, I already mentioned that, but every, not all physicians do this step-by-step uh, -step, uh, procedures. Under the intracoronary imaging guidance, uh, we have to do the pre lesion dilatation modification, stent sizing by IVUS, and post-dilatation according to the post-IVUS surveillance. This is a basic concept of imaging guided PSP. So from the Iris DES registry of about 20,000 patients, 9,525 patients with a single complex coronal regions were enrolled in this analysis. 
complex coronal regions were included, left main, bifurcation, diffuse region, severely calcified region, instance restenosis region. Primary outcome was the composite of cardiac death, target vessel MI, and target vessel revascularization. Among the 9,000 patients, prehilatation was done in 89%, sizing by IVUS was done in 54%, post-hilatation was done in 58%. From the, uh, from the, uh, from the clinical, uh, clinical registry data, only one third of patients received all three PSP component. So we compared the uh, two groups, IPSP patient, no IPSP patient. Compared with the no IPSP patient, IPSP patient, younger male dominant, but the more left main disease, more bifurcation disease. This is a procedural outcomes. IPSP group show that the higher number of stent implanted, longer stent implanted, but stent diameter is larger, final balloon size is larger. This is an adjusted capillary curve. Primary outcomes are composite of cardiac death, uh, target vessel MI, and target vessel revascularization. The IPSP group is significantly associated with the low risk of primary endpoint. In addition, cardiac death. For target vessel MI, there is no significant difference between IPSP group, no IPSP group. For target vessel revascularization, IPSP group is significantly associated with the low risk of target vessel revascularization. When we uh, when you adjust the, uh, adjusting the baseline characteristics, the primary endpoint, multivariate analysis, PSC matching IPW. IPTW consistently, IP, uh, IPSB group show is associated with the low risk of prime endpoint. Cardiac death also associated with the low risk of uh, cardiac death and target vessel MI. However, no difference between IPSP and no IPSP. But the TVR consistently associated with the low risk of TVR in IPSP groups. So this is the uh, uh, adjusted, uh, adjusted hazard ratio of the three component, the three uh, uh, composed of IPSP, the pre-dilatation, stand sizing by IVUS, post-dilatation. Among three components of IPSP, post-dilatation only is significantly associated with the low risk of primary endpoint. I think to me, this is the most important figure. It looks messy, but I, li I like to explain the slowly. The, according to the three component IPSP, we can make an eight scenarios. The no pre-dilatation, no IVUS, no post-dilatation is a reference group. Compared to the reference group, the pre-dilatation, IVUS, and post-dilatation group show that the significantly low risk of prime endpoint of composite of cardiac death, MI, TVR. More interesting finding is uh, that, look at the scenario four, six, seven, eight, the performed the post dilatation, but the stand diameter is different. No IVUS group, stand diameter is uh, 30308. But I was group three four three three two six. So I was group implanted bigger than size, even though they apply the post dilatation. More stri striking difference is post balloon size. Without I was, there is no significant difference between stand diameters and post balloon size. But with I was we can apply the bigger size post balloon dilatation. Statistically significant. Stand size is 3.4, 3.3, 3 .3, but post balloon size is 3.8, 3.6. 0.3 3 bigger balloon post dilatation. So result in the low risk of annual event, 
and associated with a low risk of prime endpoint. So this is my summary. This study showed that the so-called IPSB strategy was significantly associated with a low risk of cardiac death, MI, TBR at three years in patients with a complex coronary disease. In addition, IPSP was significantly associated with a lower risk of cardiac mortality, TBR respectively. Clinical benefit of IPSP seems to be attributed to safe and effective post-dilatation with the larger final balloon size guided by intracoronary imaging. This study suggested that the physicians should recognize the importance of IPSP strategy and more actively consider it for the treatment of a complex coronary artery disease, even in the current era of second and third generation DES. Our findings should be further evaluated through the randomized trial, such as Illuminum 4, to confirm the effect of IPSP. Thank you for your attention. Uh, personally, I like uh, this presentation very much. It's a very, very educational. And uh, the uh, any other uh, comment or discussion about uh, uh, Dr. Han's uh, presentation? Dr. Han, yeah, uh, you've shown the uh, you know huge registry data, yeah. and IPS IPSP is uh, may work uh, for the complex PCI uh, lesions. Would you uh, analyze some you know? certain group of lesions, subset, you know, long region, calcified regions, right? Any uh, complex bifurcation regions, uh, region uh, would be more, you know, benefit, uh, benefit for the IP, yes, SP we, is, I'm sorry. Yes, we, uh, thank Can you for a nice comment, nice question. We, we did the subgroup analysis according to the every regions, there is no interaction. So left main, bifurcation, long region. So the favor of the uh, IPSP. So the all cross, all, uh, crossing, crossing the all subgroup favor the IPSP. The, uh, I think it's, uh, the, this is uh, the way to the, uh, persuade the, the uh, young interventionist without the, the knowledge of the imaging. And, uh, I'd like to the, the introduce uh, the, Dr. An's the, uh, the presentation. The reason why the young interventionist, uh, the, okay, this is uh, you have to the, fix it. The region is uh, the very aggressively post dilate, but the, he don't know what, what size of the selection of the what size of the post dilation. Uh, in case of for the reference vessel size in the, the uh, imaging or IBIS or the OCT, we have to uh, the selection of four O. But he fixed the stand three O and the post dilation and three five, and then he uh, the insist that I do aggressively fix it, but actually in reality small size. Mm -hmm. So how do we the academically and logically explain that? When I look at the Dr. An's presentation, wow, that is uh, the best way to show them the, the who does not know about the knowledge of the interventionist. So when we look at the, the uh, bifurcation region, is a typical example. They do uh, the part is a very part is a very important. What size of part? Without the, the uh, imaging and. Some intervention is to do it. Okay, I do a part in the left main three five. Okay, it's excellent. But the imaging guy did. He did a part five point or four point five. Big size of it. How do we know that? So, he, Dr. Hanspin very logically uh, to show it that uh, why do we do uh, the imaging in such kind of. Thing. So, so I, I also agree that the this is a really an important you know a paper and important concepts. But because that the 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 very nice drug eluding stent we generally forgot about the pre dilatation and post uh, adjudicated uh, procedure. But the my personal question is, it's very nice to stress the importance of uh, IPSP in our daily practice. But the which would be better? Should we uh, stress more about uh, using imaging or 
should we uh, more focus about the you know pre dilatation and a proper selection and post dilatation? I personally think that the, if we use more imaging, either IBIS and OCT, I think that this you know selection adjunctive procedure the benefit may be less than the cases without imaging. So that the, I would like to ask the panels or the Dr. An about the where would be our direction? Should we focus on more use of imaging or should we focus on more stress on the, these pre dilatation and the proper selection and post dilatation? Let me uh, ask the, the same question to the Dr. Means, please. Well, my personal bias is that if you do imaging, everything else follows logically. And each step of the procedure is optimized. Once you do imaging, the rest of it just makes total sense. But to do it blinded, just with angiographic guidance, you haven't really optimized much. The, uh, in the slide of the Dr. Han, uh, he shows us uh, the seven or eight scenario. And you know, when you look at uh, the IBIS or imaging guide, is uh, the, the, when you look at uh, the size of the cell, it's a uh, 0.5 more larger. Mm -hmm. And then post dilation makes uh, the 0.2 more big size of the final MLD. So usually when we do uh, the imaging, the, we can get the uh, the uh, get achieve a 0.5 millimeters MLD compared to the, the intervention is the without the, the imaging. The roughly the lumen area, so we, we, we can, if we, we use uh, the imaging, we can get the uh, achieve uh, approximately 1.0 millimeter square, more larger one. It's so a roughly. By the way, the one half millimeter larger stem size is exactly what you calculate when you look at a meta-analysis comparing IVIS versus angiographic guidance. Right. And I, I think it's an important point um, to differentiate between PSP, which was sort of the absorb non-imaging pre-dilation stent sizing post-dilation to IPSP, which is the I is the imaging part, right? So the it's designed to be imaging guided predilation, stent sizing and post dilation. Because if you remember the original PSP, it was pretty vague, you know, predilation. Well, predilation was what? Two five balloon, three O, three five, cutting balloon, atherectomy, step, appropriate sizing. What uh, The only way to appropriately size is to image. So PSP in and of itself originally was a little bit of a misnomer, I think. And IPSP is much more accurate in terms of its, con in, ter in terms of its, its goal, and that's to be precise. Well, okay, PSP, that was, PSP was an excuse. Yeah, absolutely. I'd like to hear okay. comments from Bill Fioran. Bill, are you with us? Yes, I'm here, IK. Now tell us what you do. Well, I've been impressed by um, the randomized trials that have come out recently. And so we are using more and more imaging to help guide our intervention, just uh, in the same way that uh, has been described. I think that um, I'll, you know we're participating in Lumium 4, and so um, we're doing more and more OCT as well. And, and that's going to be interesting, I think, to see. Uh, we'll learn a lot from that trial as well. Okay. Okay, I, I got a uh, you know, question uh, to the Jiad Ali, is, is he still there? So, Jiad, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, as you, uh, personally, as I know, you you, uh, you know, have more preferred in terms of uh, OCT guidance rather than others. And the stills, we don't have a solid answer. Uh, there's the difference between the two, uh, different modality concerns. So, could you tell us briefly, you know, of which one is more a benefit for certain reasons, or which one is an advantage for some uh, certain reasons? Sure. So I lost a little bit of your question, but I think you were going, uh, I, I know where you're going with it. So um, I think the two major advantages of OCT overall 
again, I'm a very pragmatic interventionist. The first one is it gives you the, the measurements automatically. It gives you expansion automatically, MLA automatically. And so anytime you have to take your gloves off or get someone else to make measurements for you, either you don't do them or you don't get the same result as they do. So I think that's problematic globally, right? So OCT always, the MLA is going to be the same no matter what anybody does because the OCT tells you where it is. So I, I think eliminating that ambiguity, I think, is one advantage. The second advantage is that uh, for, for calcification, as Gary can tell you, I think that our... Um, strategy in terms of stratification of which calcified lesions need lesion preparation with atherectomy versus just high pressure post dilation is very practical. We know that if you have a half a millimeter thick piece of calcium that's five millimeters long and covers 50% of the arc, that's a rule of fives, you need to do atherectomy. If you don't, you'll have an underexpanded stent. And we tried to do that with IBIS, but it's a little harder, right? We haven't been able to make such a pragmatic or robust um, uh, scoring system. And I think that's really because the uh, IVUS can't look at the thickness of calcification. Where do I think IVUS is a clear winner? Uh, I think for patients with chronic kidney disease, it's a clear winner. For chronic total occlusion PCI, it's a clear winner. For osteo lesions, it's a clear winner. So in those situations, I'll be using the IVUS. I do want to end by saying one thing. I think that the new high-definition IVIS systems are very, very good. I mean, they are approaching OCT on resolution without the problems with contrast. And the durability of some of those catheters, I would say, is better. Now, I know Abbott is working very hard to get a sort of up-to-date catheter, but we have lots of choices now, right, SJ? So as part of the choices, they have to fit into our interventional practice. So... You know, if I know I'm going to do a, a, a left main, I think I'm going to be pulling for an IVIS catheter. Th that's sort of the algorithm that's in my head. Um, if I can make one quick comment, I find the IVIS versus OCT argument or discussion to be a distraction. I think the main issue is imaging versus angiography. Mm -hmm. Okay, well said. Uh, we are behind the schedule. Uh, we should move on. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Bill Fioran from Stanford. Bill's going to talk about physiology for guiding PCI, the routine practice uh, in my cath lab. Bill. Thank you, IK and Dr. Hong. Thank you for the invitation uh, to talk about physiology for guiding PCI, uh, the routine practice in my cath lab. These are my disclosures. I'd like to first uh, remind people about the alphabet soup of coronary physiologic indices that uh, we now are dealing with. Um, when looking at the epicardial vessel, we have uh, fractional flow reserve and we have uh, the non-hyperemic pressure ratios like IFR, which are the most commonly uh, used uh, indices. When assessing the microvasculature independent of the epicardial vessel, we can measure resistance either with a thermodilution technique to measure IMR or using the Doppler wire to measure HMR. And then uh, for interrogating the entire coronary circulation, we have CFR or coronary flow reserve. As far as the epicardial uh, specific indices, um, we have universal ones that are available on any uh, pressure wire system like FFR or contrast FFR or full cycle PDPA. Um, then we also have the non-hyperemic uh, pressure ratios that are uh, specific uh, to the vendor. Uh, IFR, of course, is the most well-known and a number of others have recently uh, been introduced uh, as well. And in general, these have all been shown to um, measure the same thing and, and have very uh, equivalent uh, accuracy. So when do I use coronary physiology? Uh, I'd like to just highlight a number of um, scenarios. I'll start off talking about in, in non-culprit lesions of patients with acute coronary syndromes. Uh, these data are old from 10 years ago. Uh, looking at um, patients with STEMI 
and measuring uh, FFR in the non-culprit vessel. Um, the concern being that in the setting of STEMI, there may be some degree of global microvascular dysfunction acutely that then resolves over time. And so you might get a different FFR value. Uh, this study didn't show any uh, significant difference uh, between the baseline and the FFR one month later. However, a more recent study shown here did uh, show a statistically significant difference, although numerically uh, the, the change was quite small from 0.88 to 0.86, but highlighting that probably in patients with larger infarcts, uh, there may be some component of, uh, of global damage. Um, that has a small effect on FFR. Now, there are other changes that occur in the setting of ACS. Uh, there's reactive hyperemia, um, there's hyperkinesia of non-infarcted myocardium, and activation of the sympathetic nervous system with increased catecholamines and heart rate. And all of this can lead to increased uh, resting flow or baseline flow in non-culprit territories and might affect the non-hyperemic pressure ratios. And that's indeed uh, what was shown in this study of um, 73 patients uh, with STEMI where FFR and IFR were measured in the non-culprit vessel. You see that from the acute uh, or, uh, setting to the follow-up IFR, there's a lot of scatter um, because of this variability in, in the resting flow in the acute setting. Um, FFR, as I mentioned, it does have a change too, but it's a little more predictable. Um, and the correlation between the acute moment and the follow-up is, uh, is uh, better than what we saw with the non-hyperemic pressure ratio. What about outcome data? Um, the COMPARE ACUTE trial showed that using uh, FFR-guided complete revascularization resulted in better outcomes uh, than an infarct-only uh, approach. Um, there were some interesting data uh, sub-study uh, that were published uh, just recently uh, looking at um, the event rate in the patients um, who had lesions uh, deferred uh, in the non-culprit vessel uh, as part of this study. Um, the patients randomized to infarct-only PCI had FFR measured, but there was no action done on the non-culprit vessels. And what you see is that the patients with the low FFR, less than 0.80, shown in the blue line, had the uh, significantly higher event rate compared to those with higher FFR values. And this is reassuring to suggest that um, even, if you, even if you have a STEMI going on and there may be global microvascular dysfunction, the FFR value is still reliable. What about um, uh, stable patients, sort of the bread and butter of coronary physiology, uh, who have between 30 and 90% stenosis. This is another area where I'll measure uh, physiology, particularly if there's no non-invasive tests to help guide uh, my decision. And we have data from the five-year follow-up of FAME2 showing that FFR-guided PCI leads to lower rates of MI compared to uh, medical therapy alone. Um, this uh, meta-analysis from Frederick Zimmerman uh, in three uh, randomized studies showing lower rates of death or MI uh, with FFR-guided PCI compared to medical therapy. And this is interesting because the ischemia trial, which was just recently published, is often considered a negative study for uh, revascularization or PCI in particular. But I think if you compare the uh, take-home messages from ischemia and FAME2, you see that they're actually quite similar. Both studies showed no change in mortality. Both studies showed reduction in spontaneous myocardial infarction with uh, revascularization. Both studies showed lower rates of uh, hospitalization for ACS or urgent uh, revascularization. Um, and both studies showed improved angina at three years uh, with revascularization and PCI in particular. So I think uh, we can conclude um, that uh, there is a role uh, in stable coronary disease for PCI. These were uh, randomized data. What about real world use? Um, this study was just published looking at oh, almost 18,000 veterans in the United States who had either FFR guided revascularization or angio guided. And at one year, you see a significantly lower mortality rate 
in the FFR guided group. A subsequent study from the Scandinavian uh, SCAR registry um, looked at almost 24,000 patients uh, undergoing PCI and whether or not FFR was used. And after propensity matching, you see that long-term mortality was significantly reduced in the patients where FFR was used compared to angio alone. So we have real-world data now as well to support um, the use in that setting. I'd like to make a plug for the FAME 3 trial. Um, this is a study of 1,500 patients comparing FFR-guided PCI with cabbage. And we've now uh, completed enrollment as of the fall of 2019, and we'll have uh, one year follow-up uh, later this year, and hopefully in early uh, 2021, be able to present uh, some of the initial data. Now, occasionally I'll measure physiology in patients with severe AS. Um, there are a number of issues going on in aortic stenosis that can affect physiology. The stenotic valve, the elevated uh, end diastolic pressure, LVH, adverse remodeling of the microvasculature, um, all of these can lead to a blunting of the hyperemic flow in AS, and this might result in overestimation of FFR. Likewise, uh, there are a number of hemodynamic changes, particularly that occur pre and post uh, transcatheter aortic valve replacement, that can lead to variability in resting flow and can affect non-hyperemic pressure ratio measurement. So when we look at studies, this is 145 lesions where IFR and FFR are measured before and after TAVR. And you see there is a fair amount of variability. About a little more than a quarter of patients, IFR crossed the cutoff level and FFR did in about 15%. So I think um, there are a number of things going on in this setting. Fortunately, these changes are small. And so in general, I don't think they have a big clinical impact, but we do need to be cognizant of them. And for these reasons, uh, and also because I think usually the aortic valve uh, lesion is the more important one, I'll focus on the fixing the valve. And then generally, unless it's a very tight uh, uh, coronary lesion, the moderate lesions can be assessed later after uh, the valve replacement. So another uh, important and emerging area for physiology is patients with typical angina and or a convincingly abnormal stress test who are found on angiography to have no coronary disease or non-obstructive disease. Um, these are data from our lab from about five years ago in 139 patients who had chest pain and non-obstructive disease where acetylcholine was administered to assess endothelial function, FFR, CFR, and IMR were all measured, and IVIS was performed. And I think what the study highlighted was that there are uh, a number or a high prevalence of abnormalities in these patients that could be responsible for their symptoms. It also highlighted that in about a quarter of patients, there's no abnormality. And so these are people who, if you do this assessment, you can reassure them that the coronary circulation is unlikely to be the cause of their symptoms and avoid um, unnecessary further testing and also medications which can have side effects. Why is this important? Well, these data from Korea showed that if you have a high IMR and low CFR, uh, in uh, patients with non-obstructive disease, you have significantly higher event rates compared to those who don't. Uh, more recent data um, found that if you have endothelial dysfunction or vasospasm and elevated microvascular resistance, you also have a significantly higher uh, event rate uh, compared to those who don't. So the, this assessment can help you identify patients at higher risk. But that raises the question, well, what do we do about this? Um, well, I think that's the next frontier and starting to be investigated. The CORMICA trial uh, looked at 151 patients um, with chest pain and non-obstructive disease and did these types of analyses. And then based on whether uh, an elevated microvascular resistance was identified or endothelial dysfunction, they guided the therapy uh, based on this. And those patients randomized to this uh, stratified approach had less angina and improved quality of life during follow-up compared to those who had just the standard of care. Finally, I'd like to make a few comments about um, the role of physiology after PCI, both in the stable setting and in acute coronary syndromes. 
Um, these are data from a multi-center trial looking at over 500 stable patients who had microvascular resistance measured after uh, PCI and then were followed for two years. And you see that those patients with elevated IMR had higher rates of death or spontaneous MI compared to those with a low IMR. Again, uh, highlighting that um, even in patients with coronary disease that's treated, there's still an event rate and, and that the microvasculature seems to be playing a role. We've known this for years uh, in patients with STEMI, that if you have elevated microvascular resistance, you have significantly higher uh, mortality rates uh, compared to patients uh, with low IMR. Again, the question is, what do we do about this? Well, uh, one of my colleagues in Australia, Martin Ng, is running the Restore MI study, which is going to look at whether or not uh, administration of intracoronary lytic therapy uh, in patients with elevated microvascular resistance compared to placebo uh, after primary PCI for STEMI can lead to um, improved uh, outcomes. Now, as far as measuring uh, FFR or a non-hyperemic pressure ratio, uh, these data are now almost 20 years old uh, from Nico Piles looking at FFR uh, measured in 750 patients after PCI. And what he found was that in uh, 10 to 15% of patients, you have very low FFR values, despite what looks to be an excellent angiographic result. And these patients have a significantly higher event rate at six months. Well, these data have been uh, recapitulated uh, more recently. Um, this was a study by Agarwal and colleagues where they found, again, about 20% of lesions have a suboptimal FFR um, after uh, uh, PCI. And they found that you could do subsequent intervention with either further post or further stenting that does uh, lead to significant improvements and hopefully uh, would translate into improved outcomes in these patients. As far as the non-hyperemic pressure ratios, uh, this study uh, looking at IFR after PCI was just recently presented um, in 500 patients, and they found also about 20% of cases where there was a low or suboptimal IFR result um, after PCI. And they argued that many of these cases were due to focal lesions, which again could potentially be addressed with further uh, intervention, as opposed to just a greater burden of disease uh, due to diffuse lesions. I think we now await uh, further randomized studies to show whether uh, doing uh, IFR or FFR-guided uh, post-PCI assessment can improve outcomes. What's next? Well, it's interesting, wires may uh, go away uh, from the cath lab for physiology to some degree because now we have a number of different methods for deriving uh, FFR uh, and physiology from the angiogram alone, uh, so-called angiography-derived FFR. And this past fall, we published the FAST FFR trial, which compared uh, FFR angio to pressure wire-derived FFR in about 300 patients and showed an excellent uh, correlation with a very high uh, sensitivity and specificity uh, and good, uh, excellent diagnostic accuracy. So in my lab, we are using uh, angiography-derived FFR uh, more and more frequently. So in conclusion, uh, I think there are a, a number of scenarios where physiology is helpful in the cath lab. I've highlighted a few. I think the emerging uh, areas uh, that will uh, really be of interest in the next number of years are the microvasculature uh, as well as uh, post-PCI uh, assessment. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Bill. When do you not use physiology, neither yes. pre nor post? Great question, uh, I.K. So in STEMI patients in the culprit vessel, I don't use it. And often in non-STEMI where there's a clear culprit, I, I won't use it. Um, and that's because of the acute changes that occur in the microvasculature in the setting of STEMI. Even in non-culprit vessel? In the non-culprit, I will, um, in STEMI or non-STEMI. Uh, I feel confident that we have enough data that in non-culprit, it's uh, reasonable, but in the culprit vessel, so, I mean, it's not that common, but say, for example, you have a, a mid-LAD occlusion 
and there's a 50% proximal LAD lesion and you fix the mid LAD and that's the culprit in the STEMI, um, you know, some might say, well, maybe I should measure FFR to assess whether or not to put a second stent in the proximal LAD. I wouldn't use FFR or, or a non-hyperemic pressure ratio in that setting because of the acute and transient changes in the microvasculature that occur. The other setting, which again, isn't that common, but you know, occasionally you'll see a patient who has uh, typical symptoms with an abnormal stress test and has a single vessel disease that correlates with the stress test. In that setting, um, I don't think you need physiology up front. I think you know, now the question is afterwards, after you stent, you know, should we be doing physiology more routinely as well, of course, as imaging, uh, as we've already discussed. And uh, that I think um, we, you know, we need some more data to figure out uh, if that's really beneficial or not. I have uh, one question. The, uh, what is the, the, your future perspective of the angel uh, based at the FFR? Well, it means uh, if it is uh, really accurate, we don't need uh, the pressure wire and the more invasive and uh, maybe the save the, the time for the, the invasive pressure wire the, uh, uh, measurement. Yeah. So to be honest, when uh, the angio derived FFR was first introduced as a concept, I was very skeptical and I didn't think it was going to work. Um, I was surprised uh, and have continued to be surprised by both the data that we uh, generated and that other groups have generated regarding the accuracy. And now that I'm using it in clinical practice, um, it is quite easy and quick. I mean, I can do a left coronary angiogram and then our technician can go ahead and be doing angio derived FFR while we're doing the right coronary angiogram. And then when we finish that, you know, we can be setting up for PCI of the left side and then the right side can be assessed. I mean, it, it really does streamline things. Um, it would be nice to see some more outcome data as opposed to just validation studies comparing it to the wire. Um, and there are, of course, limitations. You know, there are certain patients, um, subsets, where uh, you just can't get adequate angiographic images, uh, in my opinion, to feel confident about. And I'll still use the wire, of course, in those settings. Um, so I, I think there's still more work uh, to be done, but I'm very optimistic and, and I see it being the future. Now, what about the usage of uh, angio-derived uh, FFR in uh, post-procedural settings? I think there was a couple of uh, trials showing that the uh, threshold of 0.91 or 0.90 might have a uh, 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 prognostic um, uh, impact after the PCI. But do you have uh, any technical concern of using this technology after the PCI or stenting? Yeah. You know, again, I, I think we need to continue to get more data to, gener uh, to determine the accuracy. You know, there are a number of changes, as we're all aware, that occur during PCI. You know, you can have embolization to the microcirculation. And a lot of these things may or may not be able to be detected depending on the algorithm for the angio derived. So, um, I thought, you know, same as I was skeptical pre-PCI, I was even maybe a little more skeptical that it would work post-PCI since there shouldn't be much residual disease left. But, but like you say, um, some studies are showing that there is a role there as well. And I think certainly logistically, especially if you don't have a pressure wire down, it will uh, facilitate things because it can be a pain to try to get a pressure wire through a freshly placed stent. So, um, so I, I think there are some definite advantages, but it'd be nice to see some more data supporting it. Um, Bill, what do you say to people such as myself who argue that the NGO FFR that allows editing of the contours also allows you to generate almost whatever QFR you want? Yeah. Um, so the operator dependence is an issue. Um, I don't have as much experience with QFR, uh, so I can't specifically comment on that. With the angio derived, uh, or the, sorry, the FFR angio, the Cathwork system, you can edit it, um, but generally you don't need to very much, if at all. And I try not to be, for the very reason that you mentioned in that you know, of course you can make a lesion very small, but I think you can argue that with anything. I mean, you know, as well as I with IVIS, you know, you can trace your MLA and, and 
you know, there's some, you know, operator uh, variability as to where you place, you know, that tracing. The same with the wire-based FFR, depending on where you put your sensor, whether you uh, remove the guide catheter, you know, you can, th there's, there's wiggle room in all the techniques that we use. And so, <clears throat> yes, I, I think that's an issue, but you just have to rely on people, um, you know, to, to do it correctly. I think it really uh, influenced the reproducibility of the QF, uh, QCA itself. I think uh, edge detection should work uh, more or less automatically. And uh, in the different software like uh, uh, VFFR from the uh, P Medical, or there was a, now another one, Dame Medical, um, they, there are the different type of the software and uh, uh, correction of uh, edge is uh, maybe not needed uh, or less frequently needed in the different software. So that might also help the uh, to to yeah to 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 discuss about that kind of the argument. Okay, Dr. Hong, we should we should move on. Okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so that the I I I, I also think that the. Inter-individual variability can be an issue because that the for the reimbursement reimbursement issue especially is very sensitive in Korea. That if someone can uh, manipulate the results, that will be an issue. But the we need more data. Okay, let's move to the uh, next the uh, topics. The uh, defined flow study combined the CFR and the FFR lesion uh, assessment. Dr. Johnson. All right, thank you everybody for the opportunity to uh, join TCTAP this year. Uh, greetings from Texas and thanks for the time to talk about the Define Flow study. Uh, to be upfront about it, Define Flow is uh, sponsored uh, originally by Volcano and then of course uh, Phillips after the uh, purchase. Uh, as you've been hearing about, we've, we've had a lot of tools for intracoronary assessment and there's probably two main categories of tools for making intracoronary flow measurements. The uh, Doppler technology that came along in the early 1970s and then kind of matured into the early 1990s uh, has been around for a longer period of time. And in the early 2000s, uh, thermodilution techniques began to uh, come along both with bolus thermodilution and then later on uh, continuous thermodilution techniques. And these Tools form the basis and for a large number of indexes, as uh, I think someone mentioned already, it can be a little bit of an alphabet soup at times, uh, given the various indexes that can be measured, and you've heard about some of them already. Uh, but what the defined flow study was really focused on is coronary flow reserve. And I think the reason that we chose that metric to measure with the uh, Doppler sensor is, is twofold. Uh, the first is that there's a long conceptual history of making CFR measurements. You can see on the left-hand side that back when fractional flow reserve was first uh, developed and validated, uh, the few, first human study uh, matched up invasive FFR against relative coronary flow reserve by PET. So there's always been this link then between relative CFR and FFR on a conceptual basis. Uh, the second one on the shown on the right-hand side, largely from uh, PET literature, is that there's a, a really clear prognostic gradient that is the lower the coronary flow reserve, the higher the number of events and vice versa. And that's been shown very consistently in a large number of studies, not only for uh, very hard endpoints like cardiac mortality, uh, but also for other outcomes uh, such as a myocardial infarction and revascularization. You can see this quote here that's um, now over 20 years old from uh, Nico, Bernard and Mort uh, when they wrote this uh, paper back in 1997, really saying at the time that pressure and flow represented two sides of the same coin and were complementary. And I'll tell you that that certainly can be the case sometimes, but it also can be the case that having two sides of the same coin can be confusing. So, <clears throat> excuse me, this is a patient then uh, from the defined flow study, a 57 year old man who has diabetes and a mild angina. You can see the angiogram on the left-hand side with an intermediate lesion in the mid LED. And this is a case, as you can see from the physiology in the right-hand side, where FFR and CFR really point you in completely different directions. Uh, the FFR after intracoronary adenosine was 0.69, but yet flow went up by a 2.8-fold. So you have a case where there's a lesion that has a, a clearly positive FFR, there's no doubt about it, but yet at the same time, you have a lesion that has a very high uh, 
coronary flow reserve, well over two and a half. Uh, and so what, what should we do about these kind of cases? We saw back here that, that they're two sides of the same coin and they're complementary, but I would argue that sometimes this can be confusing to know what to do with patients like this one. Uh, now, the mechanisms for this discordance largely relate to the balance between the relative proportions of focal and fuse disease in the vessel. On the left-hand side is, is uh, a model that we developed now uh, almost uh, 10 years ago, uh, showing that in many cases, of course, they are the same, and in that case, they're complementary. But when it comes to discordance, you can see examples like this one here in the upper right-hand side of a LAD that has a high FFR, but yet a very low coronary flow reserve at 1.8. And you can see on the imaging that there's just diffuse disease throughout that vessel, obviously underestimated angiographically. Whereas the case at the bottom is almost the opposite scenario. You have an FFR of 7.3 in the mid LED, uh, but a coronary flow reserve of 2.3, a case where on imaging, there's a very focal lesion, but outside of that, a much less diffuse disease. And so that balance between diffuse and focal disease is I think the dominant mechanism for explaining a lot of these discordances. And the question, of course, then is how often does it happen? And if you look at uh, several different data sets, again, this is uh, data from many different centers using different techniques. So it's not just a, a technique issue. Uh, you see that in about 35 or 40 percent of cases, uh, the two measurements are discordant if you use traditional binary metrics. And what to do about those ones, and is it clinically important? And so I'd like to go through some of the data. Actually, a lot of it comes from uh, Korea. Uh, this is Dr. Ku and Dr. Lee's group uh, present uh, publication from several years ago, looking at combined CFR and FFR measurements and asking the question, what happens to that green group? What happens to lesions that have a high FFR value, but you do know something about coronary flow reserve. And as you can see on the right-hand side from the event curves, long-term follow-up shows that lesions, even if they have a high FFR value, do better when the coronary flow reserve is also high. So low CFR then remains a prognostic marker, even when you have high FFR lesions. Uh, that largely mirrors the experience from the other big data set that exists in the world. This is from uh, the group in Amsterdam, looking at, again, long-term follow-up. You can see out to 10 years here after combined FFR and CFR assessment, looking also at the group where the FFR is high, but you know information about the CFR. The group where the CFR was high had the lowest event rate, and the group where the CFR was low had a much higher event rate, although largely driven by early uh, PCI uh, within the first year, which is obviously somewhat of a, a discretionary endpoint. And so I think we should view that early uptick with a little bit of uh, caution. On the flip side, though, what happens when the coronary flow reserve is intact above two, uh, but we know information about the FFR? And here, for the first several years at least, the data from uh, Amsterdam suggested that clinical event rates were fairly similar. That is, as long as the CFR was intact, the FFR uh, didn't display much of a difference between initially medically treated lesions in either one of these categories. Uh, this is, I think, complemented by further work from uh, Dr. Ku and Dr. Lee's group uh, that came out about two years ago now, looking at long-term prognostic value for lesions that are treated medically that have both CFR and FFR assessment. Uh, you see a very nice, I think, splay of the curves. The, the patients that do the worst um, have both of those indexes abnormal. That's group D in red. The group in A, where they're both normal, does the best. And then in the middle, where one of the two indexes is abnormal, has an intermediate clinical outcome. I think the challenge with looking at all of this data set has been summarized on this slide, um, but I want to highlight in particular point number three, and that's the, the challenge with a lot of these uh, data sets is asking the question, why did operators not perform PCI for a lesion with a low FFR value? And on the flip side, why did operators perform PCI with a lesion that had a high FFR value when they knew some information about the coronary flow reserve? And because in those uh, previous publications that I mentioned, there wasn't a uniform protocolized approach to treatment that does, I think, cloud the issue of the prognostic value and clinical significance of these measurements. And it was for that reason then that we uh, decided to launch the Define Flow study. And I'll just walk you through what we did in order to address this issue of arbitrary treatment in some of the previous uh, publications.
The first thing is we start by measuring both FFR and CFR. And in this study, we're using the combo wire. This is a tool that's uh, currently available from Philips, but has a very long uh, industry history going back to uh, Indosonics and Joe Stent and other, other uh, companies in the past. It has a Doppler sensor at the very end of the wire and then a pressure sensor. And there, there are two models. In one model, the two sensors are right next to each other. In the other model, they're offset by 15 millimeters. But the uh, tool then allows you to obtain simultaneous coronary pressure assessment as well as coronary Doppler assessment. Because we know both CFR and FFR, we're able then to ask different questions depending on the FFR value. So let's think about the lesions that have a high FFR value. Uh, we know from a large amount of clinical data that uh, those lesions uh, do quite well with medical therapy, and so that's what we're doing uh, in this study as well. But the question is, does coronary flow reserve add prognostic value? That is coming back to this kind of two-dimensional scatter plot that I've shown you now several times um, because the FFR is high, we're going to treat medically, but is there a prognostic gradient top to bottom, um, even for lesions that have very similar FFR values? On the flip side then, if a lesion has a low FFR value, they're really two different categories. Uh, there are those lesions that have both a abnormal FFR and an abnormal coronary flow reserve. And in that case, we're going to perform PCI. Those are lesions that have the worst outcomes. We've seen that from several of the data sets that I just showed, uh, both the FFR and the CFR are positive. But the real question, and I think the key difference for the defined flow study, is our protocolized treatment for lesions that are FFR positive, but have an intact coronary flow reserve. And the threshold that we used here was two, which is a fairly standard uh, number from the literature uh, based on uh, both intracoronary and non-invasive data. And in this case, we're going to defer PCI. And that's really, I think, the key difference from standard of care. That is, yes, these lesions have a positive FFR value, but because the coronary flow reserve is intact, do they need PCI? Uh, in some ways, if you just had a pressure wire, these would look exactly the same as lesions that are down there in that blue category. Both of them might have a reduced FFR value. But does the coronary flow reserve a measurement allow us to tease those two apart into different groups that have a different clinical outcome? And so if I could go back to this patient example that I showed at the beginning, this was a gentleman who had an FFR of 6.9 in the LED, but a coronary flow reserve of 2.8. Uh, in this particular patient who's from the defined flow protocol, uh, this patient was treated medically. That LED lesion was not stented. It was uh, just given medical treatment. And uh, I'll just give you a little bit of a taste of what's to come when we present the full results. But this patient had no clinical events for the next two years. Uh, and so the question is, is this kind of patient an outlier or is this a, a more routine kind of example of what we might be able to expect from combined pressure and flow assessment? Uh, it's really a multi-center international study. You can see centers in Asia as well as a number of uh, centers in uh, Europe as well. Uh, we recently published the baseline uh, characteristics as well as design paper in the American Heart Journal back in April. A uh, fairly typical cohort, as I'm showing you here on the screen in terms of uh, risk factors, prior PCI, um, prior MI, a burden of angina, and so forth. Uh, it was a population that had largely preserved ejection fractions, uh, intermediate coronary lesions, 60% visual diameter stenosis with a site reported median FFR of 0.84 and a median coronary flow reserve of 2.1. So um, fairly typical values, I think, for intermediate lesions with uh, about a majority, about 55% coming from the LAD distribution. In other words, we've designed define flow in order to overcome what I see as some of these challenges to the current uh, literature, um, but mainly the issue of arbitrary treatments. So now we have a very protocolized way of treating lesions based on FFR and CFR. So this is uh, the final slide. It's uh, been a long-term trial. We finished enrollment in November 2017. We have a two-year endpoint. So a follow-up was completed in November 2019. Uh, and that was just about the time that COVID happened. So between getting everyone together for COVID and getting the clinical events adjudicated and figuring out what, um, what conference we were going to present to, uh, I hope to be able to show you the full results uh, in October at TCT. And it's something that's been a, a really good collaboration here between several of the centers. Uh, you can see some of us who've been involved down here at the bottom of the slide. Thank you so much.
Uh, yeah, that was a very nice presentation, uh, Niels. Um, a couple questions, um, one, or actually two, I guess, on um, the defined flow study. Um, were the uh, operators or the people caring for the patients blinded at all to the results? Because one could envision that could skew things one way or the other. And then also, as far as the power calculations, um, you know, given that there'll be just a very small subset, I presume, I, I don't know if you published that in the American Heart Journal paper that would have either, you know, low FFR and high CFR or uh, high FFR and low CFR, where is there adequate power to look at events in those those subsets? Yeah, those are two good points. So the, the first question you asked then was about blinding. And in order to get good Doppler signals, it just wasn't practically possible for us to blind operators. Uh, it's just technically difficult enough to make sure you've got a good Doppler signal for the case. And we really wanted to get a good physiology tracing. So uh, operators are not blinded to the result. In fact, they had to be unblinded in order then to have a uniform approach to treating lesions that had low FFR values. We had to uh, unblind them to the CFR value in order then to defer lesions that had a positive FFR but an intact uh, coronary flow reserve. Uh, and to the second point that you bring up, uh, you're right, there, there's really four groups that I brought up uh, in the triangle. And uh, among the population, you're going to have um, that distribution across all of those different uh, areas. And that probably means that the study, I think, is going to be hypothesis generating for what to do with that group of FFR positive, but you know, CFR intact uh, lesions. Um, it's a, a study where the endpoint then includes some softer endpoints like revascularization, uh, but also following patients for symptoms, uh, angina, medication use, antianginals. So what I hope to get out of this at the end of the day is an understanding, number one, about um, the prognostic value of, of coronary flow reserve, its relation to symptoms, and then kind of an understanding of is there enough of a signal there in order to push forward with this technology to really do a full randomized uh, outcomes trial that I think would be necessary in order to, to take it to the, to the next step. So I think it's a, a stepping stone along that way. I don't see it as being a a finally definitive trial. Great. And one other question about uh, sort of conceptually, in the beginning, you were talking about um, that case where you have a high FFR and a low CFR and mentioned diffuse epicardial disease as the res responsible factor. But um, shouldn't that also cause a low FFR? Um, I mean, I can imagine that this patient might have isolated microvascular dysfunction leading to the low CFR and the high FFR. But if you have diffuse epicardial disease, I would imagine the FFR would pick that up as well. Oh, I think you're sorry. Maybe I was misunderstanding. I think you were talking about these examples uh, on this particular slide. Is that sorry? I mean, there were two examples I was showing. I think this is the one that you're talking about. And um, maybe just remind me then you're talking about the, the case down at the top where the FFR is pretty high, but the CFR is low. Yeah, I thought I thought you then said that you know uh, the patient had diffuse epicardial disease that was probably responsible for the low CFR, um, but I I would expect that the FFR would uh, detect that as well, and I could see that there could be microvascular dysfunction, but I wouldn't um, expect that diffuse epicardial disease would cause a high FFR and a low CFR. Yeah, it's uh, for some for a case that's as extreme as this example here, where the FFR is nine nine. In that case, it's almost uh, always microvascular, and then that's that gray portion of the slide here, where it's kind of only small vessel or microvascular disease. The challenge often is in the case where the FFR say is. Um, 8.6 or something like that, and the CFR is 1.8. Those ones can be much more difficult to try to tease apart the contributions of uh, diffuse epicardial disease versus microvascular disease. And uh, the imaging in this particular case shows that it's, you know, probably a mixture of, of both. You do have some uh, plaque here on the IVUS pullback, uh, but generally when the FFRs are 9.9, you're right, it tends to be a dominant microvascular disease picture. Any question, comment, Dr. Bull?
So Nils, thanks for sharing the elegant feature, uh, elegant presentation, and the uh, we, we really looking forward to your presentation, hopefully at TCT. So one thing I'd like to comment is that the, if we have a very nice results, you are going to plan a kind of a, a randomized trial. But the uh, my recommendation and comment about this kind of trial is that the for the case with the uh, high FFR and and uh, low FFR and high CFR. So that, the, for example, FFR 0 0.7 and CFR 3.5, I'm wondering the role of the plaque stress in those cases. So that the, I agree that those cases may not have ischemia, but the considering the high FFR, the plaque should be exposed to a very high washer stress and uh, plaque stress. And we know very well that the very high washer stress is associated with the volume plaque transformation. So that the you may need a very long term follow up to integrate the influence of those the very high washer stress in those cases. It's a good point, and I'm just bringing up this example from the study. Is I think that kind of patient, right? Someone who's uh, obviously experiencing a lot of plaque stress in that mid LED lesion. Uh, what's going to happen over time? And that was one of the reasons that instead of just having a one-year event rate, we went for a two-year event rate in this study in order to understand a little bit longer term what's happening with these kind of lesions. And uh, I can't give you the results now, but I think that that's, uh, that's the kind of question that this data set is going to hopefully point us in a particular direction on. Are these the kind of lesions that then uh, do have a lot higher event rates? Um, I've shown you an example where nothing happened over two years, but it's not the only lesion like this in defined flow. So uh, I'll, uh, I'll just leave your question more as a, a teaser, if you will, uh, for the full results later on this year. Any, any comment? Um, I have uh, just one technical question. So uh, I think you, you use the uh, combo wire to do the uh, pressure velocity curve. Um, but um, I know that sometimes it's very um, um, challenging to get the uh, very nice pressure velocity curve. So um, for, for the practical point of view, that do you think that the, uh, um, maybe you cannot answer now, but how frequently you, you have this uh, um, abnormal CFR despite FFR so that you should really do this uh, CFR measurement and how technically is that challenging in the cath lab? Yeah, it's a great question, and it's one that we had as well. And so that's why we've uh, sent all of the tracings then to a core lab that was blinded, blinded to the angiogram, to the site, to the operators, to what values they had. Uh, and they really reported their values independently. And so that's going to be one of the uh, key secondary endpoints in this trial is understanding the, because operators then make their own assessment in the lab as a way then of figuring out the treatment. But how often did that match up with kind of a, uh, a cool detached calculation uh, of what was going on afterwards. And so we're going to also report then the core lab values for physiology, how often those agreed with the operator's assessments, and then also an analysis of outcomes uh, simply using the uh, core lab values for physiology versus the uh, site-related values. And uh, I think, too, that's something that the core lab is probably going to have a separate publication looking at the kind of quality issues that they encountered through this. I think it's an opportunity for uh, Philips, the company that has this product now to learn from, uh, to take these tracings and see which kind of ones uh, are getting good signals, what art, what are some of the pitfalls that are uh, going on, even among very experienced sites, uh, very dedicated sites like the one in this protocol. Any more comment? Okay, I'd like to uh, summarize the four session and uh, uh, Dr. Ziard and Dr. Fionon is uh, uh, present us uh, the real practical value of uh, the imaging and the physiology in the cath lab. And uh, Dr. An's presentation personally, I think is uh, add uh, the new uh, information for the value of the, the imaging. Uh, the imaging guided P uh, PSP and uh, Dr. Johnson specifically, they uh, point out that the value of the uh, FFR and the CFF, uh, CFR in the uh, patient with coronary artery disease. Professor Zhang, would you comment or the closing remark about the, this session? No, I, I really enjoyed this session. Uh, you know, it's compact, very practical.
And I really uh, thank you very much uh, to the speakers and the organizers. Uh, I guess we can wrap up. Okay, thank you, sure. everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.